Okay, so it's just turned three o'clock. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Craig. I'm co-chair of the PSA's Teaching Learning uh, Network and delighted this afternoon to invite you all to the, um, welcome you all to the fourth uh, PSA Teaching Learning uh, webinar that we've had uh, this season, uh, part of our work to support colleagues through the um, COVID crisis and uh, to enhance teaching and learning. We're delighted today to be able to uh, in, to welcome uh, Christine Liston Bandera from University of Leeds who will be talking about scaffolding learning, how to guide and engage your students into online learning. Uh, Christina is a professor of uh, politics at University of Leeds where she uh, teaches in the policy uh, team. She's co-director of the Centre for Democratic Engagement and chair of the UK Study of Parliament group uh, and has published extensively on parliaments uh, around the world. She's also a National Teaching Fellow and in 2010 was winner of the PSA's Bernard Crick uh, Prize for Teaching and Learning. So it's an absolute joy to, to welcome Christina. Uh, just to remind everyone the session is being recorded and will be shared with uh, members. So if you don't want to sort of appear on screen, if you turn off your camera uh, and, and then you will, um, you will not appear in that. Um, and there is a chat function, so please use the chat function uh, to raise points, questions, and to pursue the discussion. So uh, over to you, Christina. Great, thanks very much, John. Um, and thank you very much for letting me come and talk for an hour about online teaching, one of my favorite topics, um, but one that wasn't very fashionable until recently, and then suddenly everyone is panicking about it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, share the screen hopefully and have a, I have a presentation to talk through but I will be asking you questions and I'll be asking you to put those thoughts in the chat room but more importantly I'm hoping at the end to leave quite a bit of time uh, for questions because sometimes it's about specific things, specific examples that, uh, that we, we can give. Um, and it's really nice to see so many familiar face, faces, including Sarah's uh, wardrobe behind her, which I'm very familiar with by now, <laughs> with all the seminars we've been together. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now, so just bear with me. So hopefully you can see uh, my screen. Um, with a beautiful picture, which I wonder where that could be from. I ask you to think in your heads, where could that be? It's not Portugal. Those of you who know me know that I'm um, sort of Portuguese and lots of different things. Um, it's actually the North York Moors, the beautiful North York Moors. Um, and the reason why I have that picture in there, there's different reasons to it. One is that I absolutely love walking and love the North York Moors, but also to very much to give this idea that um, online teaching, online learning and all of that is really about guiding your students in a learning journey. It really is a journey and I think it's best to think of it in terms of having a journey and guiding them and showing them which way to go and if they don't know where to go they're just not going to be really very effective at, at doing the learning. So in this case if, if, I, if I didn't know where I was going, if I didn't have a map, if I didn't have an, an indication of where I want to, to go in terms of my, my path and my walk, I would just get lost and wouldn't get to nowhere. And online teaching is very much about that. It's about guiding your students. But why am I talking about online uh, teaching? I'm definitely no expert and you may have lots of questions, specific questions that I can't answer. I'm not a technology person. Um, I'm not one of those uh, amazing people who spend their lives doing pedagogical research in these areas. I've done very little bits of it, but I'm talking about this mainly because of my experience. So I created an MA uh, completely, totally uh, taught online in 2003, the MA English Civil Studies Online, which was the first politics MA in the UK entirely taught online. And I mean, 2003 is a long time ago. My oldest son was still in primary school. My youngest son didn't exist yet. So it really feels like ages ago. And this, then this MA then um, was taught for about 10 years. So 
so I have a lot of experience from that. I also did, also did some online pedagogic training just to be able to teach on that at Masters. And then since then, I've had teach, you know, taught on those dreaded research methods modules that we have to teach our students, compulsion, all that, with a very strong online learning element to it. And every time I can, really, well, in all of my teaching, I use very strong blended learning approach. So what I'm going to talk to you about is based on this experience. I am no expert, it's just from what I've learned from my own experience. And in there, you've got a photo of what we use for our Masters in Illustrative Studies Online, which at the time it was something called Merlin, which is an amazing VLE, but you'll see that throughout my, my presentation I actually have many other examples of different VLEs. And one of the things I want to convey really is that don't fuss so much about the technology think more about what you want to achieve in your teaching and whatever the technology is is about adapting the technology to what you want to do rather than the other way around and in this master this photo that you have in here are two of my ma online students who i have i never taught i never met sorry throughout the, the duration of, of of the course so i only met my students if they came to graduation and the major thing that um, struck me, other than the, you know, the huge happiness of actually finally meeting them face to face, was they're all really tall. And if you know me, you know I'm quite short. And it's something that online, if you're online, I'm sitting down now, you have no idea really how tall or short I am. And it's something that always struck me when I met them actually face to face to show I know them really well. Over two years I've taught them, but ultimately I actually don't really know them. Online never is a substitute for face to face. What we need to do is to think about how to make the most of that situation. But you shouldn't think of it of doing exactly the same thing you do face to face because it will never be, even if you're trying to do a, a good job of, uh, with it. So, what does online teaching mean? I wonder if you can think in your in your own head, um, or if you want to practice the, the chat function now, by all means, do. Um, online teaching, what's the first word that comes to your mind? I know a lot of people will think of panic, some people think of technology and one of the things I like to emphasize is that instead of thinking of online teaching is to think in terms of online learning and often we, we're so um, obsessed with giving access to resources to our students that we think about so much about all the materials that need to be going in there and we think about them just all the teaching material being there but we don't necessarily think about the online learning what are the students going to do with that material how are they going to learn just because you're teaching doesn't mean they're learning and when you're in an online situation you really need to think much more about that about what is it that you need to do to make sure that the teaching you're doing is actually resulting in some learning? And in order to do that, um, I like to spend just a little bit of time thinking about what is lost. And I asked you uh, when you went uh, in in the, um, in the instructions for this for this seminar, I asked Jamie to put in their little thing from me, and hopefully some of you saw that and ask you to think about what is lost. So when we move teaching online, we're not face to face anymore. What is it that we've lost by, by doing this? And if you're a cat owner, and this is my formidable Jeeves, who's usually in the red chair behind me, but he's not there today, so to not distract me too much. And um, if you're a cat owner, write into the chat one thing that you think we lose by going online and I'll give you just a few seconds to do that So plenty of answers coming in there, a range of ideas. And what we can see is actually the PSA doesn't have many cat lovers, cat owners, because I thought there'd be far more answers in there than the ones we have. And from the fact that you don't have the campus, you don't have the social cues, you don't have all those things that you're putting in there, I've divided those into two different areas. And some of these referred to some of the things you've put on the, on the chat. 
So we don't have the access to campus, obviously. And that's all, like the main thing that happens in here. And all of the things in here are to do with the physical side. So I think there's a physical side and there's a social side. We don't have the ease access to services. So if students come into university, they will have maybe difficulty finding where the library is or where the finance services or disability services are, but they will find them. There will be signs indicating rooms. If they don't know where Lecture Theatre 10 is, they will find signs saying where Lecture Theatre 10 is, where the Social Sciences building is, etc. We lose obviously the classroom. In here we've got a photo for some of my students within the classroom and so the presence in that space which becomes your shared space with your with your students and this shared space between themselves in the, when, when they're learning and that spe that shared space becomes quite important to the learning because it's where you meet every week to share your own experience and what you know about that particular module you also obviously lose the fact that you can ask a quick question say at the end you can have any formal chat you lose the spontaneity it's much more difficult to have that spontaneity online than it would be if you were in the physical space together and and then there's a whole other side to that which some of you alluded to which is the social side of what is lost so it's not just the teaching it's not just the material you know the lecture notes the lecture slides uh, the books from the library or all those things. It's about all the other things that make universities. Universities are learning communities. Universities are excellent places to learn, not because they are, I'm sorry to say to all of you, full of fantastic lectures and professors who know lots about things, but because of everything else we have with that, with the fact that students meet other students, with the fact that they have clubs and societies, with the fact that they are independent and do their own thing, and choosing how to how to use that time while at the other universities so they are huge communities of learning and they are a very important part of students but it's not just what happens in the classroom the other thing that's also lost obviously is knowing who else is around so um if you are on campus this is a photo by the way of our campus at, at leeds university of some of our students and you you will get to know who's in your course you'll you'll see a face you might talk to them you might have heard how they've said it in the classroom in your module in your school department you will know who the staff are even if you're just bumping them into, into them in the corridor you have that possibility of dropping by the office bumping into tea into peer. so again you don't you lose all of those things all of those things that happen naturally all the social clues that happens naturally However, there is a lot also that is gained by going online. That's not to say that one is substituting the other. It's about thinking what we lose and what we gain. So make sure that what we, with what we gain, we can use some of that to maximize what we lose uh, by going online. So in this slide, I've got a few things that we gain by going on online teaching. And hopefully with the examples I've given you at the end, they'll become a bit clearer. So we can gain a paced learning. So if you think of you know, just a face-to-face -face teaching, students come in for 15 minutes for a lecture and then they go, or, 50, or students come in for a 50 minute seminar or two hour seminar, whatever it is, and then they go. In an online environment, you have the possibility to pace that learning. You have the possibility of giving the control of the, of the, of the rhythm and the, and the speed of that learning to the student, to the learner. They can go back to the same material time and time again if they want to. They can decide to what, at what speed they go through material. You can also use more prep for learning, which we supposed to do up with seminars when we ask them to read 10 uh, highly uh, academic scholarly papers, which no one does. Um, and you, if you think of that though, in terms of more practical and more uh, specific type of tasks, there's actually loads of chance to use the online environment to do that. In this seminar that, I, that I'm doing today, this webinar, I'm trying to use some of those techniques. So by giving those instructions I asked Jamie to send you, it's just a really, really basic example to show you of something very simple you can do to prep for the learning, small tasks, small thinking that then you can use in, 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 your, own, in your own classes. 
there is a possibility of reinforced learning because you can go through material uh, far more at, at your own pace. So when I've, whenever I've used online learning, and particularly say online uh, text forums, discussion forums, so one of the groups that really benefits from that is the groups actually it's overseas students who don't necessarily understand our spoken English as well as our own British students and who can go through the material at their own pace and who can then reinforce the, the, the parts that they, that they haven't necessarily um, got this as well as the first time. So you have the ability to review and to reflect. One of the things I find interesting about online discussions uh, when they are properly facilitated, so this is not social media discussions, these are properly facilitated online discussions, is that you have the ability to reflect on what you're saying and take some time and then give your answer. In the seminar, um, if you ask questions to your students, they have that pressure to give their answer straight away. They might not necessarily give such a good answer as they might have done online where they've had a chance to think about that. And you don't have the gain of the classroom, which is really useful for all sorts of things. But on the other hand, you don't have the constraints of classroom. You don't have only 50 minutes or 55 minutes to fit in a seminar where you want to do lots of things. You don't have the constraints of a classroom where you don't have access to the news, to people outside, to whatever that may be. So you can do things outside the classroom. You can link to ongoing politics far more. You can ask your students, for instance, every week to check, I don't know, on MPs, Twitters, what they're saying on, on, on Twitter, on opinion polls, how the opinion polls going from one week to the other. Um, on uh, the UN, what are the latest uh, discussions, resolutions in the UN? You can, you can use those things far more than you might be able to do in a classroom. And by doing that, linking to ongoing politics and, and follow that much more, you have effectively expanding resources. You don't have just the resources that you have in the physical space of a classroom. And as we move on, I would like, I'd like you to think also to tell us a little bit about what you think hinders learning. So that's another thing that I ask you to, to think about. And before I move on to think about what we need for learning and how can we use online teaching for that. So in this case, if you are passionate for food, like I am, those of you who know me know I'm obsessed with food, write into the chat one thing that you think hinders learning. Off you go. <clears throat> Plenty in there coming and they're still coming which shows, and I hope Roger is listening to this, um, that PSA members absolutely love their food. So next year's conference, when we do it, we better have really good food for everyone because uh, PSA members are passionate about food. So let's see some of what you, what you thought about that hints learning, if it corresponds to what I think needs we need to actually encourage the learning and some of it will correspond to that you know lack of trust and the fact that students just don't do what you, you tell them to do and so thinking the opposite of what hinders the learning is thinking about what is needed for learning and last week in one of the seminars at the end of one of the questions was about what do you do if students don't have the confidence to to participate and this is very much about what's in in this slide for learning to take place, you need lots of different things, but one of the key things you need there is trust. If your students don't trust you, if they don't have faith in what you're doing, they're not going to do what you ask them to do. Likewise, if they don't trust their mates, their peers, why should they engage in that activity? We are the same. If we don't trust someone who's giving us leadership, and there's plenty of examples of that currently in the country, we're thinking, well, should I follow those, in, those, those instructions or not? I'm not sure. So trust is absolutely fundamental. We also need to understand the mode of learning. So some of the, the comments in there was about um, the fact that uh, people just don't, don't do the things that they're supposed to do. And part of this is that if you don't know how you're learning, how the teaching happens, then 
it's much more difficult to engage with it. If you think about our first year students, when they come from A-levels to university, our overseas students, when they come to, and, and study with us as a UK university, one of the key things we spend hours doing is thinking about beautifully developed induction activities to teach them how to learn at university or how to learn at UK university. And if we do that for face-to-face -face teaching, why wouldn't we do that with online teaching? We need to explain how the online teaching will, will take place. We can't assume because they're supposed to be digital natives that they'll know about online. They might know about how to use Instagram uh, and Discord, but they don't necessarily know how to use your online teaching, what you're going to do in your online space. So that's really important, understanding the mode of learning, understanding what the rules of the game are. If your students don't know that your seminar is 55 minutes and you're, you're, actually, able, you're actually supposed to read before you go into seminar and supposed to participate, they're not going to be doing that. They're going to be expecting to be told and to listen. So they need to, to have an understanding of, of how to do that learning feeling at ease feeling the confidence so again if, if they're not comfortable in the group and you know you're exactly the same thing if you're in a meeting and you're really uncomfortable that there you are not going to participate you are not going to say anything you need to feel the confidence to be part of that and you need to have access to key resources and you need the motivation to learn if our students don't have the motivation to learn they're not going to engage with anything you do there's obviously plenty more that I could put in there. The reason why I focus on these is because they, they really touch on very important things that I find with my experience are really important about successful online teaching. And it's all about to overcome what is lost. So remember all, all the things we talked about that is lost and to make the most of what is gained. So making the most of those things we can do online to try to overcome that that is lost. And to do that, the students need to be guided into the online mode of delivery. And I think so often we forget about this. We forget, we sort of assume that students will know how tech lectures will take place, how seminars will take place online, or where the resources will be, where the specific documents will be. All of those things, they, students need to be guided into, into that. And the learning needs to be more student focused. So rather than assuming that you have to develop lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of materials and resources for your student to access and then to assimilate, think about what can your students do in their teaching so it's about doing active learning type of approaches where the students maybe access a resource and then have to do something with that whether it's to answer questions in the discussion forum asking a question to to appear or, or doing a, some sort of activity rather than just making them being very passive in receiving what we give them and then it's about continuing engagement becomes more important and that continuing engagement becomes important because when we are doing our teaching face to face in a university students come to our lecture and then come to our seminar and off they go we don't see them for a week but in between they are engaging with with, with the university they are uh, meeting other people they are doing that uh, community learning that we talked about uh, earlier and but by going online that disappears and having that continuity becomes particularly important to make sure they stay engaged and they don't go uh, completely lose track of everything that's happening because by going online you sort of lose track of everything else of all the other different activities and communities and to do that i've identified three c's in terms of clarity communication community there's plenty of other things but what I like to do is now in these three slides, and this is I'll, I'll sort of finish in, in, in these really, is to give you some, some ideas, some things that I've used in my online teaching. And, and when I was thinking about how to organize these and what are the most important things in what I do, and I come to this conclusion that these are the key three main things, that if I'm doing these three key things, then everything will be fine. Whatever technology I use, whatever, we, however many mistakes I may make and, we, and we, there's always a, a trial and error thing happening, it will be fine. So I'm going to look at each one of these now. So clarity. Having clear messages, clear signposting might seem a really obvious one, but actually it's so important and it's so important to reinforce of why, why it matters. Whether it's, you know, whether it's email messages, whether it's announcements or messages, it's about assuming that students, uh, not assuming that students will know what to do. And rather than relying in a really complex, long, 
Word document, PDF document, which may have all the rules and which you may need to do, it's besides that giving clear messages of what they need to do from the fact that now you need to go into that forum, which is in that folder, which is in there, and you need to do this. It's about signposting. Um, if, you, if you have ever done an, a course online yourself, you will know how difficult it is to find things. Or if you access a, a website from any organization, you'll know how difficult it is to find things. The information might be there, but you need to signpost, you need to be very clear about where they'll find uh, the resources for the lecture, where they'll find the reading for, for sp specific seminar. And then having clear areas for different purposes. So one of the things I always have is, for instance, a forum or something like that about general queries about the module. Something that works very well is FAQs, frequently asked questions. Things students ask a lot. So I'll just put that in there and, and then students can ask questions in there too. Um, or an area just for assessment. Students are obsessed with assessment. So I usually have a forum or something like that just for questions about assessment. So it's about guiding the students through the online space, making sure that they know where to go for whatever they need. And you can do that in lots of different ways. And one of the things that I do is I use instructional tasks. So very, very simple tasks like, you know, like I asked you today, think, think of five things um, that you lose by going online. Very simple tasks and then where to go and put that information and then do something with that information more than I'm doing today with this webinar which I'm just illustrating. Now there's a photo in there. I hope you can all see the photo. Does anyone recognize any of the people in there other than me looking really really young there? Um, for those of you who are into parliamentary studies you might recognize our good Lord Norton. He may even be in the call, I don't know. And some of you might recognize also Louise Thompson down there. Um, and this is a photo from, our from one of our graduations from the MA Institute of Studies Online, where Louise was our student. The reason why I have that photo there is because of this lady here. This lady here was Doreen, Doreen Miller. She did the MA Online. She started the course at the age about, I think she was 72, and, and so graduated at the age of 74. She was actually a baroness herself. She'd been, she was a minister in, in, in Patches governments, I think. She'd never used a computer in her life, and yet she did the whole course online. And that's because of that clarity of the guiding, of taking the students through the space, making them do lots of tasks, experimenting. She did require far more tasks and experimenting and, and guidance than, say, Louise did, but she got there in the end. And it's all about thinking from the student perspective, where can I give them a chance to ask questions and to understand the, the, the environment and to be as clear as possible. And then the next one, communication, sort of very linked, very clear, sort of closely linked to clarity really. It's about having that regularity of communication. Um, so to keep that regular engagement and it's far better to do short and frequent messages than doing really long uh, messages um, every so often. Um, it's about marking the presence of you there. So one of, the thing, one of the things I've done a lot with my own students and duties at this time of COVID-19 crisis is to keep regular contact with them and just keep saying, sometimes I don't have much to sell them, but just say, I'm still here. If you want to ask a question, just, you know, just let me know. And you can do that by email, by announcements, or by forums, uh, channels. Um, so just have spaces where, uh, where you're constantly uh, sending communication out. And then nurture that regular communication. So for instance, one of the things you can do is like in this channel here about what other news saying is students could have a task every week to go and check what has um, a particular, I don't know, what the Times, what the Guardian have said, on um, George Floyd or something like that, something is happening. Or it could be about following an MP throughout a, a, a term. It could be about uh, decisions from the World Bank, whatever they can be, a task that is there, which students regularly have to come to the VLE and input their own, uh, their own findings. Uh, one of the things I do is I, I tend to do a weekly summary of the key points covered. So that, because there's so much information that students go through that they don't necessarily always capture all of that and I use text emails a lot but also when I can every so often I use video and audio and this is particularly important for those students it's, it's important for communication it's important to 
to break uh, the monoton monotony of, of text, but it's also important for those students who have learning difficulties and for whom text is not necessarily the best way to learn. And there's loads of tools where you can do these things really easy these days. And so my, my last C is a community. And, and this actually, I think, is the most important one. And it's one that you probably do with friends, you know, you do um, in sort of naturally as a person, part of a social group. But it's one that online really needs to be nurtured because it doesn't happen uh, naturally. It doesn't happen spontaneously as it would do on face to face. And there's lots of little things you can do about this. You can create spaces for people to introduce themselves, which I usually do. So there's an example here of introductions, who is who. This is another one about who is who, trying to encourage them to have photos rather than just a very anonymous type of avatars. Um, in the introductions, ask them about something specific. I've used that many things from your favorite film, your pets, uh, best prime minister in the U that UK has ever had, your special places. There's many things, simple things you can have to ask people about. And in this webinar, if you've been paying attention from the beginning, you would know that I like walking, you know that I probably am near the North York Moors, you know that I love food, you know that I'll ha I have a cat. All of those personal stories, what they do is they fill a space with identities and they nurture that feeling of being part of a community. It's about feeling that you belong to something. And so they have a very specific purpose of developing a sense of a learning community. And I'm nearly finished, you'll be glad to know. Um, so some more uh, simple tips, and there's beautiful Jeeves there again, sitting on someone's thesis. Um, about being flexible, um, being flexible in terms of adapting what you're doing. Uh, it's always important to have the rules in terms of how you teach and how you learn, like on campus, but it's also important to be flexible, because particularly with online, because not everyone has the same uh, access to technology, uh, that you may have and and sometimes you do have to adapt because of those uh, those uh, constraints in that photo we have uh, had earlier one of the students was actually from Zimbabwe and he had lots of problems of accessing to technology so we had to do a few th different things because of him um, repeat key information that's something that actually online is really important because you, you don't always necessarily go to the same place for the information you miss out information really easily um, start small, again, that's really important. Start with introducing your students to the online environment. So before going straight into a lecture seminar, do small tasks to introduce them to the, to the online environment, then to introduce them to the module, to introduce them to each other. And from that, build up on that until you actually can do far more because they are engaging, they are participating. And keep it simple, don't go, super complicated um, sometimes some online courses are so complicated have so many tools and and gimmicks to it that actually just lose sense of what you're trying to do and it's more important to go slowly at a pace with your own students um, don't disregard the informal that's why Jeeves is in there uh, students will engage with me not necessarily just because of what I know about parliaments but because they engage with me as a person and that comes through you know social cues from being interested in them from all sorts of different things it's about being a person really about being uh, um, someone who connects with others and that this point here is really important focus on what you want to do rather than what the technology can do technology can do really complicated things but if they're not doing what you want to do don't use it keep it simple uh, make sure you're comfortable with what you're doing don't start using things that you, you don't really know where it's leading to use things that your students are comfortable with also all of them or the majority of them um, rather than going you know to lots of gimmicks things that only one or two students might engage which might sound amazing and might be amazing but maybe only most of your students are not engaging with that uh, be consistent with your school. I find it's quite difficult to keep this balance. So 
at the same time you are being innovative and bringing lots of different things but I think keeping a consistency with your school university is really important also so one of the things that I have done along the years is I've changed university I've changed lots of yearlies lots of times but I try to always be consistent with my university so currently my university uses the VLE which I absolutely really 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 dislike which is blackboard but that's what we have so i have to work around that rather than bringing something completely different um, it's about adapting what there is in there and i think that consistency is important because ultimately they're not just doing your module they are part of a school and they're part of a university so my key message is, is think in terms of online learning rather than teaching think about student focused uh, think beyond the lecture and the seminar delivery, what else is around that that make that lecture and that seminar be the most uh, useful for everyone and engaging. Maximise the advantages of online delivery and guide your students through that mode of delivery. And all of these things, plus the clarity, communication, community, are the same things that make these three students be comfortable enough to go at the front of the classroom and present the flip chart paper and explain it all despite the fact that some of them actually were really really shy and would never say anything it's about developing that that easiness and that trust with the environment and to make them engage with what's happening in there and that's it so i'll stop sharing now Hi Eunice. Thanks everyone. I think we now have time for the for the Q and A. Um, thank you for the questions that you posted in the in the chat box. So um, it's okay by you, Christina. We'll just we'll just get going with some of the questions, yeah. um, which I've made a note of. Um, I'll just start off with um, one of my own, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in in the feedback you've, you've got from students over the years in response to their key needs um you know do, do you monitor that is it something you've kind of gathered ad hoc or do you think it's something that should be structured into kind of a, into the module or the program or even at a university level what it is actually students find useful what they want etc it's something that recently i haven't done as much but i mean i still do because um um, I do a number of things. So over the years, um, because I have had interest in pedagogical research also, I have also collected feedback from them, um, partly because I was doing the online teaching at the time and I knew it was the only masters in politics or, um, in, in the country. I wanted to understand what worked, what didn't work. And then with my masters teaching also, uh, I was aware we were asking students to do things that maybe other places were not doing. So I, I did from, you know, formal sort of survey type of feedbacks to actually other things which um, are much more uh, flexible to use and one of my favorite methods this is not online but it can be done online is actually something that developed by Simon and I think he's in the call somewhere Simon Ashwood which is the ABC feedback which is just very simple um, three three questions give them so if it's face to face give them uh, some um, post-it notes and write with a what you think we should abandon with b what we should begin with c and um, what we should continue and 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 through that abc uh, feedback which i usually do halfway through the module so not at the end halfway through and it's very flex it's very um informal and students usually give me really good ideas through that feedback of what's not really working what they're really enjoying and again you could do that online uh, exactly in the same way uh, so I try, I try usually to do both. Yeah. So there's there's a formal feedback, obviously, but I usually try to do other things in between. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. And, and that kind of links to a separate question that someone posted, which was about um, how do you monitor um, students' level of kind of technical knowledge and comfort, etc. Again, I, is that something that you kind of take the same approach to um, as you as you go along? Yes, yeah, so um, that's why I think starting simple and small is really important. So you have an idea of who can do what. I mean, this this term, um, because we've moved on to online teaching so quickly, one things one of the first things I was very concerned about was to to suss out how comfortable our students to be online and to teach and to, to learn online because just because they're young people we shouldn't assume that they are comfortable with that and, and i'm sure some of you in here will have had experience of doing a, 
I don't know, a Skype call or something to your student and your student is really doesn't know what to do because usually they use those technologies to talk with their mates, not with teachers, not with lecturers or professors. That's really scary. And it's interesting how to make them get into that environment thinking, no, we're just talking to each other. We're just using different um, means to do that. And this term, for instance, because we had to move so quickly and thinking of that flexibility that I mentioned earlier, I really had to adapt to different circumstances. So from communicating, some of them only want to talk to me through Blackboard, others just through Skype, others MS Teams, others Zoom. And I wouldn't usually have that many different, uh, different ways of talking, because I think it's important to have clear paths of, of, of where the learning is happening. But it's about the flexibility and about sussing out what's what's most easy for them to use so in the in the case of the ma english to studies online i mean we had students um in uh, bolivia in turkey uh botswana vietnam um edinburgh london all over the place zimbabwe i couldn't assume that they will all have access to good internet connection and and for so in those in those days <laughs> that's a while ago now uh, for instance, we did mainly things on text rather than video. I mean, today I will use far more video exactly because I can't assume people will have, say, broadband to, 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 to utilise that. And, and that's why it's important to do small and, and, and little by little to source out what people have, what they can access, and then, you know, do it bigger if, if, if you can. I think that links quite nicely to a question from Chad. Um, he uh, wrote about kind of the considering the kind of the current situation the fact that so many universities had to move very quickly to kind of online mm -hmm. learning and have this kind of hybrid situation what about the mindset and expectation that some students have where learning equals the physical classroom uh, obviously the shift of kind of online learning mid-semester kind of made that probably worse for many for many universities yeah. and many kind of teachers um yeah. but it is something perhaps that some students who sign up to a traditional university kind of have in their have in their mindset in, in a way they, they maybe they don't have if they sign up to a, to an online university or an online course yeah definitely and and i think i mean one of one of the issues there's lots of different issues in here one of the the, the, the issues we have is that people often see at university as just the face-to-face -face teaching you know the face-to-face -face, uh, one hour lecture or, or one hour seminar when we all know all of us in here know that the university is far more than that and it's about the papers you're going to read it's about the thinking you do it's about the opportunities you give your students access to like getting them involved in your own research and there's lots of ways of doing that but i think that's that's an issue that we face as a community that there's not always the the, the understanding out there of what university learning is about and we, you know, I'm sure all of us in this room here now have had people saying to us like in May, so enjoy your summer now, or your students say, well, I hope you had a good summer. And it drives me absolutely insane thinking, do you think I have the whole summer now just for doing nothing? So it comes back to that same issue. And that's, but that's why when you move to online learning, it's even more important to to, ex to sort of outline, explain, guide that the teaching is not just that one hour lecture, that there's far more there, there's loads of resources. And in politics, I mean, it's an amazing discipline to, to be teaching. Every day something happens, it might contradict what you taught last night, but you know, every day something happens. And even if it did contradict, then you might think, well, okay, so what does that tell us? So it's about, it's, and online in some ways you can do that better because students you know are just there the environment the, the VLE the virtual learning environment is there and they can use those resources and go ahead and explore those resources um, but it needs to be outlined it needs to be explained um, almost like you know explicitly say teaching learning is not just about the 50 minutes where you have a delivery of a lecture it's about thinking about it and whatever is needed to help with that thinking whether it's reading a paper whether it's to go and, and look at some parliamentary reports whether it's going to look at some news whether it's to actually go and talk to people uh, about the topic there's many other things we can do and i think actually that's one of the great things about teaching politics is that it's it is literally all around us and every day there's something new to talk about just kind of 
moving to kind of to one side slightly, I mean, how much technical support, uh, support, this is a question from Rose, how much technical support did you have to set up the, the fully online learning course that you're, you're talking about? <laughs> Obviously, we have, we have kind of different kind of um, engagements with kind of online learning, don't we? We have kind of the courses which are designed to be set up online. Then we have the situation that some people are in currently, which is kind of switching to online. So this is kind of two things at play here. Um, that makes me laugh how much support did I have um, basically my my own initiative and the fact that I signed up I mean I was very fortunate actually so I was at Hull University at the time and I was very fortunate because there was a really exciting small group um, called the e-learning team who developed that first VLE that I showed you in one of my first screens called Merlin I love the name still today I love that name I, I just wish that VLE still existed but that was developed by a really enthusiastic team at Hull who saw e-learning as a pedagogical enterprise not a technology one and so that it was developed thinking about the pedag pedagogy you know thinking about how do people learn and so they were doing small, you know, small training uh, seminars, things small for two, for two weeks. You'd go on it and, and do a small seminar uh, training about this and about that. So that's how I started. I started going to those small trainings, but, you know, for, by my own, because I decided to, to do them. No one in my department was doing those. And then they offered uh, a master's and then they offered uh, some more uh, training for that. So I did those. And then, but then the, the system is actually very simple. So it, there's not so much technical expert, expertise needed for that. Um, I think whatever technology we usually have expertise we have in terms of the support that is given uh, by technical teams is all that is needed. I think actually what's more important is to think about what you want to achieve, what you want to do. So think about your teaching and think about um, I mean, to put in a very prosaic way, what are the, mo the, the learning outcomes you want to achieve? You know, what do you want your students to think about? So, um, you know, I've gone from, I don't know, Merlin, Sakai, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard. I've used that, or, or social media. I use Twitter also, for instance. I've got a hashtag for my modules also, on, on, always on Twitter. So I think it's really important to think the technology is there to enable you to do what you want to do. And the fee of technology should not hinder you from doing what you want to do. And if if there are if you have questions, queries about how to do how to use specific technology, which is absolutely fine. I often have. Um, there's usually somewhere online that has those answers, or there's usually an IT team or someone or your peers, you know, your your colleagues. I've found often the people who are most helpful to do. A simple thing it might be your colleagues who have used it before so to, to answer Rose's question I didn't really have much technical um, uh, training and um, the pedagogical training I think is more important and but these days at, at the time it wasn't really compulsory to do pedagogical training um, but I think these these days most people do that because of the HEA uh, fellowship recognition so it's it's more standard and it's about applying that to online. Um, we've got quite a few questions about kind of student engagement as well. Um, uh, kind of one from, from Mark is uh, about how do you spot non-contributors in, in large classes because it can be quite difficult to keep track of kind of who's taking part. Yeah. Um, and then one from kind of Katerina who asks um, any tips to keep student engagement throughout the, the online course. Sometimes we see attendance diminish in the course of the year, which obviously may also be the case for face-to-face -face delivery. So any, any kind of comments on en engagement generally? And I think also I'm, I'm quite interested in whether or not you think that we should kind of track student engagement or should we mm. kind of be a bit more kind of um, organic about it? Um, I'll start with, with that last one. I think um, in, in many ways what we experienced in the last few weeks, I think I imagine that what I've experienced is the same that a lot of people have which is keeping that regularity of contact with our tutees and students is really important. And then, um, so some ways I think it's, it has to be organic, sort of do what you do and just be attentive to what's, what's happening. However, if there are students who are systematically never logging in or never uh, replying or never participating, then those are the students you focus on. And in terms of my tutees, 
I've got two or three students, uh, three students that can think specifically who, to who that would apply. And then I, I specifically go in touch with them and, and actually others also. So specifically then contact or do more with those who completely disappear. Now, in terms of how you track that, most VLEs, by VLE I mean virtual learning environments, so whatever it is that university use, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, um, my sentiments if you have Blackboard, most people do, uh, whatever that may be, that most of them have um, uh, learning analytics where you can see who has logged in and who hasn't, and that usually gives us a map of to spot not necessarily those who are engaging because you'll know who those are but those who are not engaging and whenever that happens and i see a pattern there, and it's the same thing as face to face isn't it if they stop attending completely what we do is we get in touch with them and i would do the same thing with with online teaching i would follow up and see are there any issues and i think online is particularly important to do that because once we switch off from this zoom call today it'll happen in like in a second. And then I won't see Mark Shepard who's down there up in Glasgow for, I don't know, months and months, maybe years and years. I won't be able to say, how are you? How are things? You know, it just disappear. So online, it's got that paradox that we're all together here and there's 84 people now together. We're all together from different countries, but in about 11 minutes, we'll be on our own. And think that from the student perspective, the student is on their own at home in a room sometimes maybe in not a very nice environment and suddenly when you disappear that's all they're left with and so those students who are really not even resurfacing in your online environment and engaging with you i think that you need to get sort of in touch with them and see what's happening there a question from jack kind of following on from that um again about um, engagement and also um, kind of how to kind of teach generally. Um, what do you think about trying to replicate discussion seminars via audio and video link? If we're teaching online only, should we abandon that in favour of kind of asynchronous discussion such as forums? Yeah, that is a really tricky one. It's one I've been um, uh, debating myself recently. So in this in this last term where we all had to move really quickly, what I decided was to do my lectures um, online video synchronously, so at the same time, so my students all logged in at the same time as me, and I gave my lectures through Blackboard Collaborate, which actually is the only bit of Blackboard which is good and it works really well. Um, and you can actually see people, you can actually have a conversation with them and all of that. So I decided to do lectures in that way and I decided to do seminars through asynchronously text, so through discussion forums. And I decided that because, partly because I wanted to have a continuity of engagement there and we moved really quickly. So I had to decide really quickly what I wanted to do and I wanted to communicate that to my students really quickly. This is what we're going to do from next week. And I didn't want to change that again because I thought there was no point of, of trying to change as confused as messages. And I think that worked really well in terms of, I think it's important to have a time of the week where we all together. Obviously, if it's a lecture with 400 students, it's not exactly the same experience if you have 30 students, but it's still important to have a moment where we, you're all together and having that secrecy uh, at least once and then maybe doing the discussions uh, uh, asynchronously because there are advantages to that in terms of having um, maintaining that continuity of engagement, making people come back to it and making people being able to reread what other people have written. So there's lots of advantage to it. Um, but I'm, I, I'm saying this, you know, but I don't know if, if, if that's the right solution and I still haven't decided what I'm going to do next term, whether I'm going to keep this model or whether I'm going to also do the, se the seminars online secretly um, uh, with a video but even if I do that I will still have for sure discussion forums because I'll still want so this links to the question of how do you keep them engaged you need to have something in there where they keep adding things to it it's almost like um, uh, in Portuguese you need to reminding me we have a term saying grown, grown, you, in your purple. you put little things one thing after the other to the other to the other and then by the end of it you've got a big community of lots of ideas and thoughts and that will have been you know 
all those students are brought together. So whether it's about go and find out what um, Jacob Rees-Mogg put on his Twitter account or Instagram. The Instagram is much more interesting actually for, for Jacob Rees-Mogg. What did he put on, on, on his Instagram this week? And then next week, go and find out what uh, Harriet Harman did on, on Twitter, whatever. You know, regularity of activities in, like that. And again, you know, politics is happening every day, every second. There's so many things you can ask. And those are the things that keep the engagement, is that continuity, is, is to keep bringing them back uh, to the environment. So that then we come, when it comes to the lecture, they haven't forgotten about you. They know exactly what the module is about because they have been engaging, even if very mildly, uh, along, along the way. I think we have a couple of minutes left and I think that leads to a kind of a really interesting question which is about um, preparation time. Um, Natalie um, posed a question about how much time are you taking kind of to prep your online teaching compared with the time taking to prep for the physical classroom. She says yeah. she feels like she's been spending significantly more time with the online stuff. Yeah I think with, with online teaching there's definitely more work at the beginning I think I think once you've done it for, for a little while, then you get into the rhythm of it and there's actually less, particularly if you follow that perspective of being student focused. So doing tasks for the students to do and then the students respond to, to, to you and bring their own work into it rather than always think you have to give them loads of resources for them to engage with because they, they won't necessarily do that unless it's done, you know, um, really, really carefully. And, and, and it actually works better to make them active. It's about active learning. So I think it takes a lot of my time to set it all up, to think about the seminars, to make them introduce themselves, and all those things. I would say that the first two, three weeks, um, it definitely takes more of my time. But then after that, it sort of normalizes to the, the same time that you'd have face to face. Okay, so I think we've reached the end of the question and answer uh, time for today. Um, just to wrap it up, can I first of all thank Christina for an excellent talk, really helpful. I can see from the sort of discussions on, and questions that it's really engaged uh, the colleagues who have, have, have come along today. Uh, and there are a great number of you, so it's been a really popular session, so thank you. Um, if you want more, and I'm sure you do, our next um, webinar is next Wednesday when Natalie Jester, who I can see on this call, um, will be speaking about replacement or supplement, asynchronous teaching, accessibility and methods. That's Wednesday the 10th of June at uh, 3 p.m. So please sign up on the PSA website and please look on the PSA website for other events. Um, there are specialist groups running uh, events. I was at an excellent discussion on European public policy last year, uh, sorry, last week, being run uh, online by a number of specialist groups. And there's also an opportunity on there to get information about the uh, fourth European uh, teaching le learning conference for politics um, and to engage in that in a couple of weeks. So please do look at the PSA website to sign up both for next week and for other uh, PSA and related events. Uh, that's all for today. Uh, thank you, Christina, and hope everyone has a, has a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.